Thank you, guys. I'm extremely humbled to be up here. And every time I step up here, I just wonder, okay, God, really? Do you want me up there? And then he, I'm up here, and he speaks to me, through me, to you guys. And I'm just um, very grateful for that. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, as you guys know, we've been going through the book of Daniel. And um, I have to admit to you guys that I have, I have never read the book of Daniel. And that was something that I was like, okay, so we're going to be studying the book of Daniel. So for the last two months, I have just dug, I have dove deep into the book of Daniel and it has been such a great experience. And, um, and, and I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of that I've never read it. You know, I mean, it's just one of those stories. I remember hearing it as a little kid, you know, you heard about the, the guys going into the furnace and then you heard about Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. And so I, I knew the titles. I knew, I remembered those Sunday school lessons, but to actually get deep into God's word and to where I stand today on my faith and be able to understand it and to be able to take that, um, the direction from the Holy Spirit to go into all these different, these other areas of these other books. Um, I've gone, I mean, all over the Old Testament into the Chronicles and Kings and all these others. And then I've gone over into the um, New Testament and I've been all over Matthew and, and just learning God's word. It is so amazing whenever you're actually preparing to share something with somebody, you get so much information out of it and you get such a conviction. And so I just challenge any of you and every of you, every one of you to go ahead and read the book of Daniel and pretend like you're going to have to get up here and preach it next week, because I tell you what, God is going to really reveal something to you whenever that happens. And so just to kind of recap, because I think it's important that we remember what we've learned so far in the book of Daniel. If you guys remember, Remember, um, the first week that we were studying through it, we were listening and learning about King Nebuchadnezzar whenever he went to Jerusalem and he stole items out of the temple. He took the king from Jerusalem. He took some of the people from the royal families and the no nobility. He wanted all those strong men that he could come, bring them back and make them his servants. And so that's whenever Daniel was captured and was brought and him and some of his friends were brought over. And you know, at this stage of Daniel's life, he was only 50. 15 years old. And I think about myself at 15 years old. And I think if some king would have came and kidnapped me, I'm not sure I could have stood as courageously as Daniel did on his convictions. And so I just, I, I think that's amazing. And we learned that the, some of the characteristics that God looks for um, in us, and we can see it in, displayed in Daniel, was his integrity that he had. He had great integrity. There was no compromising going on there. He had great discipline. No matter what was going on, he stayed true to the disciplines that he had learned. He had courage. No matter who was telling him to do something, he stood firm in that courage, that God-given courage. But he also had humility. And that's one thing that I just really admire about Daniel is that he had this humility that he didn't have to get all crazy up in your face trying to convince you of something, but instead he had that humility and he let God do the work. And so that's what we learned that week. And then the next week we learned about King Nebuchadnezzar and his dream and how he wouldn't tell anybody his dream. Do y'all remember that? I would think that's kind of a bratty move, but it was okay because God was able to use that and God revealed the dream to Daniel and he was able to tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was as well as interpret it. And so that's whenever King Nebuchadnezzar then said, surely your God is a God of gods. He's the Lord of kings. For this king to pronounce that, that was pretty big because these kings were pretty full of themselves and often made idols of themselves, right? So for him to be able to do that, that was amazing that he was able to see God work through Daniel. But then he quickly forgot, if you guys recall, he quickly forgot and then he made a gold um, statue and had everybody worship and bow down to that. And he said, anybody who doesn't, you're gonna be thrown into the fiery furnace. You guys remember that? And I thought it was interesting right there because he, he proclaimed God, but then the very next chapter, as Pastor Jesse had pointed out to us, then he made an idol of himself and he wanted everybody to worship that. And I found it interesting because I believe the reason Daniel was able to stand firm on his convictions is because he, he had Daniel-like faith where he studied the word, he knew the word, it was his faith. 
It wasn't his parents' faith. It wasn't the faith of his neighbors. It wasn't seeing somebody else, you know, have blessings in their life, but it was Daniel's faith. But King Nebuchadnezzar, he, didn't, he just kept seeing it happen to other people, but he didn't have his own faith. So it was easy to blow him over, right? His foundation wasn't there. And so, like I said, we see then that his friend, some of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get thrown into the fiery furnace, but then they're rescued by God's angel, right? And again, King Nebuchadnezzar proclaims that God is great in that he issues a decree that everybody should um, fear our God, right? But again, he loses it. It wasn't until chapter four which, of Daniel, which we're not gonna go over today, but I'd, like I said, I uh, encourage each of you to read it because it is quite an amazing story. But in chapter four is whenever you see that King Nebuchadnezzar is sent out into the wilderness to live amongst the animals. And that is when he was actually personally affected. And that is whenever he then came to his true faith and believed God to be the most high and knew that God was sovereign over all kingdoms of man. And so I thought that was a really interesting thing that all these, all these times he was seeing these blessings, ha blessings happening, all this saving that God was doing, all this protecting that God was doing, but it didn't ever stick with him. He needed to personally experience it. And so I thought that was really, I, I just wanted to share that, like I said, to recap that with you guys. And so this was one of the kings that Daniel had influence over. But then if we fast forward a little bit, we'll go into chapter six, and this is now King Darius, and he is uh, the Medes Persian king. He came and they conquered Babylon, so now the region's getting bigger and bigger and everything, this, this kingdom is getting larger, okay? So we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna read through quite a bit of chapter, uh, uh, scripture so if you want to turn to your Bibles or open up your um, iPads, iPhones, whatever it is that you're using, whatever you kids are using these days, um, if you'll go ahead and turn to chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. And it starts out, and remember, this is King Darius who's now in charge. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout I gotta change my page. The kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. And so right here, Daniel is, okay, remember he was 15 when he was first taken into, uh, he was taken away from Jerusalem. And now he sits and he's somewhere around 80 years old. And still right here, he is distinguishing himself by his exceptional qualities. And those exceptional qualities that's God showing through him. That's God's blessing on his life. And if you go to another translation in the King James Version, it actually explains it as the excellent spirit. So I can't see that as anything else but God shining through him. And one of the things about Daniel is that my point number one that I want you to write down, to have Daniel-like faith, Daniel served well because he served God first. He was able to be the best employee because he served God first. He was able to be the best administrator here because he served God first. And that's something that we can take away. This is Daniel back in this, this time, but guess what? We can take from his human example. You know, we got Jesus as our example, as the perfect example, but this is Daniel. I mean, we can be like this, right? We can be like this other human right here. So he served well because he served God first first. And sometimes I think we get kind of, um, we get a little wrapped up and we're trying to convince non-believers. Like when we get into those conversations with non-believers or when we get around non-believers, a lot of times we try to convince them that God's way is the best way because we've experienced it ourselves, right? But just like King Nebuchadnezzar, he had to experience it himself. He was able to see it, but he had to experience it him himself. But we today, what we can do is we can walk in the standard of God and we can be that light for others to see. And so whenever I was studying through this, it brought me back to a verse that I really, uh, I took into heart one year and I actually meditated on this verse for the whole year and it really helped me. And it's out of Matthew 5 and it's verse 16. And it says, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father in heaven. 
And so if you really take that verse in, we're, sh- we're here to shine our lights so that men, men can see our good deeds. But what are our good deeds? When we're walking in good deeds, that's the standard of God that God has established for us. We're walking in God's promises. We're walking in that faith. And so when we do that, then they can praise our Father who's in heaven. It's not about praising us. And sometimes we get wrapped up in that and we want to receive the praise. I'm guilty of it. Sometimes I have to check myself before I wreck myself. And so I have... <laughs> I mean, it is, right? You start getting this praise and then you're just like, yeah, that's God. That was God. That was, I couldn't have done that in my own, you know, in my own power right there. So um, I encourage each and every one of us, the way, instead of trying to convince people that God's way is the right way because God can do that. But what we can do is that we can just try to understand where people are coming from. We can try to understand where they've been, what they've experienced. And then that's when we can then give them some constant encouragement, the encouragement of God's word. And so when we do that, that's whenever we can take it in and we can start serving others well because we have served God first. When we're serving God first, it's gonna be easy to serve others well. And so some of the ways, like, I, I don't know, we're, I'm sitting here talking about how we can encourage other people. And sometimes it's hard when we're sitting there in a spot and we know we need to encourage someone else. But, you know, God's given us so many tools. And I feel like I talk about this a lot, but he's given us the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, right? That Holy Spirit helps, can, it, it helps can um, comfort us and to convict us and it, and, it, and he leads us in the right area, but also God has left us by the Bible. The Bible is God breathed. Everything that comes out of here is from him. And just like me, this being my first time to really dive into the book of Daniel, God has used this to reveal so many things to me. And one of the things that he's revealed to me is I've been, in, I've been in a position here at Ovation Church for about the last four years, and my prayer was always, God, use me. Use me to be an instrument for you. Use me to be a mouthpiece. Tame my tongue that, so that I can help someone else, which none of that was wrong. That was all good stuff. But God, sometime in the last two months, I've been really studying deep into his word, and it was revealed to me pursue me. He said he wants me to pursue him. And whenever I pursue God first, serve God first, I'm going to help. He's going to use me. He's going to use me to help and encourage other people. And so that was a big revelation that came to me. And then it was solidified right here in the book of Daniel. Serve God first and you will serve others well. And so, okay, let's go ahead and get back into... um, Daniel chapter six, we're gonna start in right at verse four. And it says, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither uh, corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an etiquette and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repelled, repealed, repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Sorry about that. So right here, it's, it's, it's a great thing. If we go back to the top of that, it's a great thing because they're trying to catch Daniel in something and they can't catch him in anything because Daniel stands so firm on his convictions. But the sad part is, is that King Darius is kind of fooled. He's fooled because in there it says that all of us have agreed that you're the one that we all should worship. So King Darius, they played in on King Darius's pride, did they not? They played in on him like, King, you're everything that we need to worship. Let's just all worship you for the next 30 days. And they knew they could get Daniel. They knew they could catch Daniel because Daniel stood firm. And so I just think that's an awesome thing that they could never get him. And you know, Jesus tells us the same thing. He tells us that we're gonna be persecuted in his name. We're gonna be 
persecuted because we follow him. And actually, in Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12, it says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so to study Daniel and to know that Daniel was persecuted, and then Jesus comes and he tells us, you're gonna be persecuted the same way, but blessed are you. And that's a hard thing to swallow because sometimes whenever you're being persecuted and you just want to waver and just kind of hide in a hole, but Daniel didn't, he didn't turn back. Let's go ahead and read Daniel, uh, the verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Nothing was going to sway him from honoring his God. Nothing was gonna, no decree was gonna stop him from doing what he knew God had wanted him to do and to be able to receive the blessings and the promises of God. And I just, the thing here that I see is that Daniel went, he learned about this decree. Of course he did. He was one of the three administrators, right? So he learned about this, but He still, no matter what, he didn't get on Facebook and do a blast and tell everybody how wrong they were. He didn't send out a blast on email and tell everybody that this policy's just stupid, but this is what we're gonna do. But instead, he stood firm in what he knew he needed to do. He didn't waver against that. And so my point too, in order to have Daniel-like faith, Daniel studied God's word. What did he do here? He went home, he faced towards Jerusalem, he got on his knees and he prayed like he had always been doing. And if you go to 1 King, like I told you guys, I had gone all over the book with the, the book of Daniel, all over the Bible with the book of Daniel. But if you go to 1 King chapter 8, verses 44 and 45, This is when King Solomon is blessing the temple and he's praying to God. And he says, if your people go out where you send them to fight their enemies, and if they pray to the Lord by turning towards this city you have chosen and towards this temple I have built to honor your name, then hear their prayers from heaven and uphold their cause. And so Daniel, he had to know that, right? He had to, he didn't just guess that if he turned towards Jerusalem, got down on his knees and prayed that God would hear him. He knew that because because he studied God's word. And so, and in this moment, he knew that if he prayed, God would hear him. And just like us, we pray and God hears us. And so Jesus actually tells us when we pray, and this is in Matthew 6, verse 6, and it says, but when you pray, go into your room, shut, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And so Jesus, tell, he gives us that perfect example of prayer, and he tells us to go in our room and pray, to pray. Have that moment with God where it's uninterrupted, and, and just pray to him, and he's going to hear you. And that's not to say that us praying in public is, is wrong. I'm not saying that, so don't get me wrong, because praying in private, that's between you and God. But when we're praying in public, that's whenever we're encouraging each other, we're loving on one each other, one of each other. So when we're praying, we're learning how to love one another and we're learning how to have concerns for one another and we're aligning our word with God. And so actually, if you look in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, It says in here, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. And I believe this is where when we're we're praying, we're encouraging each other to be built up. We are interceding for maybe this broken heart that needs to be prayed for, or maybe this sinner that's just having a really hard time. And so we come together and we pray, and God tells us that when we do this, he's listening. It doesn't matter if you're praying privately in your closet or if we're praying publicly together. He, that prayer is just as strong either way. God's listening to that. And so Daniel knew this, and he knew this because he studied the word. And um, lastly, I'll just throw 1 Thessalonians 5.17 at you. This is one of the first verses as I ever uh, memorized, pray continually. (laughs) Pretty easy, right? And so I used to always, before I really got close to God, 
I used to always think I was talking to myself, and I've shared this before, but now I just talk to God all the time. You know, I may not end it with an amen, but I am talking to God, and then I don't feel quite as crazy. And so, and he listens to me, he hears me, and he confirms things for me. And um, something to know about prayer is that when we do come to him in prayer, we're not praying to inform God about his realities. He kind of already knows, as we learned a minute ago, he already knows what we're gonna ask for before we even ask it. But instead, what we're doing is we're aligned aligning our hearts with his. We're aligning our hearts with his reality. And so as we study the word, he talks to us through that. And I just, I just love that about it. Now, okay, we're going to get back to the um, chapter six. And this is a pretty big chunk that we're going to read right here. We're going to read through 12 through 18, but I want you to listen to it. And I want you to find out and pay attention to what's not mentioned here. Okay. So let me go. So verse 12. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Do you, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or man except you, O king, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repelled. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went out as a group to the king and said to him, remember, O king, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. So what was missing in there? What di who didn't we hear about in there? We didn't hear Daniel fight God's will. He, we didn't hear Daniel try to talk his way out of it. We did hear King Darius. Now, King Darius was fooled, like I told you. Earlier, he was lied to, and he was told that everybody in his administration said Yes, do this, and so he bought into it, but he forgot about Daniel. He forgot about Daniel, his faithful servant, the one he wanted to promote, did he not? He was thinking about promoting him up over all of his administration, and instead, now here he is, and he's trying to find every loophole he can to get out of this, but these decrees that are made, they can't, they, he can't let that go away, or it'll, again, his, his um, kingdom, his reign, his authority will be in question if he lets that pass. So he just had to submit and he had to send Daniel to the lion's den. But the thing we never heard was Daniel. Daniel didn't fight this. Now I can imagine at this point, Daniel knew what both sides of the coin was. He either served man or he served God, right? And so Daniel chose to serve God and that's what he, that's what he did. And so he wasn't gonna fight it. If it, meant, if it meant that he had to bow down to this, to this king, King Darius, or if he had to serve his God, he was ready to go into the lion's den. He was ready to go. And so number three, my point three is to have Daniel-like faith. Daniel surrendered to his faith in God. And you know, as humans, we have a lot of choices. We have yes and no's, ups and downs, ins and outs. And we have some of those more important choices we have to take. We can choose to be a hero or a coward. We can choose to fight or run, love or hate, forgive or hold on. We can choose to serve God or serve man. And this is where Daniel chose to serve God again. And this is where he chose to not, sur he just surrendered to God and to God's will. And it takes me back to the story of the, of the fir fiery furnace whenever Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were getting sent in. And what those three said to that king, to King uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, they said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. And how, I know there's been many times where we wanna just submit, 
We want to just like maybe, even at this time, I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They could have just bent over and like maybe tied their sandals again or, you know, just looked like they were worshiping, but they knew they weren't worshiping. But the point was is that they stood strong. They stood up and they stood firm in their convictions and then God saved them. God was there for them. So let's go ahead and go on to 19. And it says, at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you have you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angels and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, O king. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. So many times we're lowered into this lion's den and we're expecting to be mauled by the culture that we live in. And so many times there are people that will then get into this culture and just kind of adapt into it. But God hasn't called us to be that way. God has called us out of that. He has called us to not be of the world, but be, in, we're not of this world, okay? And so he's called us not, he, we call, he's called us into the lion's den, but he's gonna protect us when we stand firm in him. And that's exactly what Daniel did here. There wasn't a scratch on him. There wasn't a wound on him. And in the same sense, if we, when we go and we read the next one, Daniel came out and some people might have even been like, yeah, well, those lions just weren't hungry. That's probably what it was. Or maybe those lions were lame and they had no teeth or something. Something, something had, there had to be some coincidence, right? But if you go on, it says, at the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. So there's no room for coincidence right there. The lions weren't maimed. They weren't missing teeth. They weren't already full. But that was an opportunity for that kingdom right there to see that God truly, truly closed the mouth of those lions. And whenever this this, this is just one of those examples whenever we can see that God was there and we can glorify God for being able to see exactly what he did. And so I wanna go ahead and finish out this chapter, chapter six. I'll go ahead and read the last bit of it, starting in 25. It says, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language throughout the land. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And that right there was evident whenever Daniel came out without a scratch. The others went in and they were, they were, they were, done for. And this right here is because Daniel's steadfast faith came, came through whenever King, and King Darius saw this and he issued this. And I want you to know, like, not only was this one example of where um, Daniel's steadfast faith was able to be um, seen, but also if you go into um, the book of Ezra, you'll see that King Darius in his second year, year of reign, he then issued for the the temple of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. So because of this example, because Daniel gave this example and he illustrated it, whenever you have a godly, uncompromising life, an um, uncompromising life, yes, that's right, that example can live on and it can, it can prove that when you live like that for God, that God will deliver. And, and, and the potency that happens whenever you stand firm in your convictions, when you know what your convictions are and you stand firm in those convictions, the potency is further than we can ever see. We affect people, the light shines brighter on people, and so I just wanna end by sharing with you guys the Daniel-like faith. I'm just gonna, just in closing, just go over these again. When we serve God first, we serve well. When we study God's word, 
We know what we're standing on. We know what our convictions are. When we surrender to God's will, he will deliver us. He will never forsake us. And when we have steadfast faith, he's gonna deliver past what we can actually see. And so the book of Daniel was such an eye-opener for me because I realized that it wasn't about what I was doing, but it was about me pursuing God the whole while he was pursuing me. But it was about me surrendering to God and knowing exactly where I stood with him. And whenever you know exactly where you stand with him, that nothing else matters. There's no, and you know, we go into Romans 12 too. I'll just share this in closing. It says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I wanna say that we're not to conform to this, but by be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We wake up every single morning and need to renew our minds. We need to set our, our sights on God. We need to pick up our cross. We need to pick up God, Jesus's yoke. And so I just challenge each and every one of you to do that and to be just have Daniel-like faith. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pray us out and then, um, then you guys will have a great day. We have some announcements to share with you. But if we can just go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for just uh, giving us this book of Daniel to be able to study through God. And I just pray and encourage each and every person out here just to dig into your word, God. You have so much to share with us. And I think sometimes we, we, sh we shorten what we know about you. And we just, maybe we only understand the, the Sunday school stories. But Lord, I just challenge each and every person out here to get deeper than just those Sunday school stories, but to actually dig into your word, God, because you have so much to say to us. And when we stand firm on our convictions with you, God, when we know your promises, you protect us. You are surrounded by it. We don't lack any confidence whenever we know what your promises are, Lord. And I just encourage each and every one of us just to dig into your word, to have steadfast faith, and to just come to you, God, at your altar, surrender to you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.